All right, so M. Night fans are in for another twist and turn psychological horror story with his latest knock at the cabin. Four strangers, one cabin, the signs are all there. But yeah, we're going to be breaking this thing down for y'all, what the ending means, a whole lot of symbolism, and of course our reaction and review of the movie and the mandatory M. Night cameo. All sorts of heavy spoilers in this one, so a huge thank you for clicking this. I'm your host, Jared. Now let's get into Knock at the Cabin. Alright, so Knock at the Cabin opens on a family of three on vacation at a remote cabin in the woods. As we're introduced to a young Wen catching grasshoppers. It's funny because she's kind of like categorizing these into her little notebook, showing that she's an inquisitive little girl. She looks up, though, as a stranger walks out of the woods towards her, and this is Dave Batista's Leonard. After the two play a game of back-and-forth questions, Leonard's friends follow behind, and he tells when his heart hurts because he has to make a terrible decision that day. Bam! We are right into the home invasion portion of this movie, as Leonard and his group try to calmly reason and discuss what is about to happen, but have to kind of use force against Daddy Andrew and Daddy Eric. The couple is tied up after Eric hits his head, resulting in a concussion. The four strangers line up with their makeshift weapons, and Leonard tells them that they need to make the ultimate sacrifice to stop the apocalypse, and one of the three must willingly give their life to stop it by the hand of another. What? No! Obviously, Eric, Andrew, when, hell, even me was like, what's the catch? What, what's the twist here? The four calmly introduce themselves. Leonard, a school teacher, Sabrina, a nurse who spent most of her life savings getting there, but like, like how? She, she only drove a car. You're, you're a nurse. You should be getting, whatever. Adrian, a cook who has a young son, and Redmond, Harry Potter's best friend. They all claim they had shared visions of the end of the world, Terminator style, which guided them together and led them to this remote cabin. So at this point, this seems like a random encounter, but the couple, specifically Andrew, believes that it's a targeted attack on the same-sex couple. Leonard, the leader, assures him that that's not the case, and that every time they say no to their demands, the four of them will release a different plague upon the people of the world, essentially judging them. Again, sounding like some January 6th 4chan poppycock, the three refuse, resulting in Redmond being the first to give his life after their no response. While Redmond states that a plague will be released and he unalives, Eric sees an out-of-the-ordinary bright light behind Redmond, but thinks nothing of it. They turn on the television to see a massive earthquake has occurred, sending a giant Johnny Tsunami barreling the west coast, taking thousands of lives. Okay, I'll bite. What the hell is actually going on here? Leonard assures them that everything they are saying is true, they must just believe them. But it's pretty hard to believe when they claim the visions of these so-called nightmares just came to them in the middle of the night. A few more personal snippets of the four mysterious people's lives, how they met, and flashbacks of Eric and Andrew. The flashbacks show the hardships of the pair as a couple, adopting when having to lie about their relationship, and driving to the cabin only hours before. Andrew and Eric still in disbelief, this series of question, answer, unaliving, plague continues, with Adrian sacrificing herself. Resulting in the second plague, a virus called X9, affecting thousands of children. Wen distracts Leonard and Sabrina, allowing Andrew to break free, grabbing his gun from the vehicle, and then shooting Sabrina as she tries to attack him. Again, they say no to Leonard's demands, and soon the newscast on the television showcases hundreds of airplanes across the planet falling from the sky, resulting in, again, thousands of deaths. Andrew, still skeptical of everything, urging that they are in some weird-ass cult, the broadcasts are fake, and again claiming that this is a targeted attack, when he remembers being assaulted years ago in a bar by none other than Redman. Things are a bit squirrely now because, yeah, th th there's got to be a catch, right? But Eric is starting to believe in Leonard and claims he saw a vision of a glowing figure when he saw the bright light earlier in the film. Leonard, being the last one, again asks them if they are willing, but again receives a no. He urges them that they will only have minutes to choose after his passing or they will be destined to walk the scorched land after Earth is destroyed, just the three of them. 
Lightning begins to rain down after Leonard's passing. Eric and Andrew still don't know what to do because is any of this actually real? But Eric steps in, saying he believes there's a reason he saw the glowing figure, and the four were actually the four horsemen of the apocalypse, embodying the essential components of humanity, malice, nurturing, healing, and guidance, as Andrew then shoots Eric. Andrew goes to Wen, hiding in the treehouse as they watch burning trees fall on the cabin, destroying it all, as then the skies clear up and the lightning stops. The pair make it to Leonard's truck, discovering that everything that the group said was true, meaning that all of the visions and plagues ha had to be true too, right? They drive into the nearby village, seeing a diner full of people, watching newscasts from around the world covering the destruction that just took place. The belief is real. Even one of the waitresses can be heard talking to a loved one on the phone, expressing their love for them. The final bit sees Wen and Andrew get back into the truck, and Boogie Shoes, the same song that the three listened to on their way to the cabin, plays on the radio. The two turn it off and then back on, wondering if everything was a coincidence or if they should believe that it's a sign from a higher power as they drive off into the sunset. Alright, so uh, yeah, there's no big twist. No big M. Night Shyamalan. He was dead the whole time reveal, so uh, apologies for anyone who wanted their brain exploded. But there is a lot of symbolism here that clearly alludes to this encompassing religion, belief, those who don't believe in a higher power, rather chalking it up as a coincidence, and the second coming of Christ. This is pretty much hinted at throughout the film. For example, the couple thinks it's Jehovah Witnesses at the door originally, they are fear-mongered into believing like some religions do about heaven and hell, there's a mural of Jesus playing basketball when adopting Wen. Sabrina mentions that she hadn't been to church in years because it was boring, and that people should believe in something bigger than themselves. But it's very much hammered home with the four horsemen, the plagues, and the impending apocalypse. Sure, it's revealed close to the end of the film, specifically that each of the four people embodied going back to, you know, the malice, the nurture, healing, and guidance. But Shyamalan did some clever costuming because the color of their shirts reflect the traits before the movie reveals who they actually are. Red men conveying malice was wearing red, which typically means anger, aggression, or warning. Also, historically, red was, quote here, the first color named after white and black, symbolizing him biting the dust first. Also, if you look at the blackboard in the background, it's kind of teased. Adrian was nurturing because she was a cook, and blue is a calming, relaxing, trustworthy color that is reliable for support. Sabrina, being healing, she was a nurse, and yellow affects the logical part of the brain, stimulating perception. And lastly, Leonard was guidance, being a teacher and a coach, with white or light pink, I, I don't know, I, I might be a little bit colorblind, but it's a mix of self-reflection, warmth, and compassion. So, Mr. Knight, <laughs> good job on you with those colors. Anyway, Eric, Andrew, and Wen were specifically picked for this sacrifice because they were full of love and purity in a world that otherwise was not. Now, Andrew was very much on the outskirts of things, having selfish ideas and such. They had all been through prejudices, though, deformities, treated like outcasts, but remained unbreakable. And Eric's vision was what truly ended it all. He finally believed. It's almost like a seeing is believing approach. Like all the other four that received visions from the four horsemen, Eric instead saw God, maybe Jesus, a deity of some sort, or even the fabled fifth horseman, which is said to bring about rebirth and grow a healthier future. This is why he slowly started to believe in something greater than himself, and he could see Andrew and Wen living the dreams that they always wanted to in the future. Even the grasshoppers in the opening sequence symbolized patience and a leap of faith that they all had to take in order to stop everything. I, I could be dead wrong here, but I think Knight was going on how we need to change the way we act to save the world. And lastly, the Boogie Shoes song at the end is just, just toying with everything we just saw. The belief that we should or shouldn't have. Was it a coincidence or was it a sign from a greater power? Was the entire series of events coincidence or a greater sign? 
What exactly is the happening here? I want to say Andrew and Wen believe in a greater power, telling them that Eric is now in a better place, watching after them. But for everyone at the diner, coincidence might still be what they believe. Now knock at the cabin, which by the way, knock that like and subscribe button as it helps keep those pesky horsemen away and the spoilers flowing. But yeah, this is uh, roughly based on the 2018 novel, The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay. I briefly glanced through a summary of this before, and I would say that a majority of this kind of follows the same story beats, different characters doing different things here or there. But two of the biggest differences between the novel and the movie is that Wen does not pass away in the movie. I know that this was a big moment in the novel, and the ending is not left ambiguous, you know, like the novel. M. Knight mentioned in an interview that he actually called Tremblay about the changes that he was going to make, and surprisingly, Tremblay said that M. Knight's ending was his second choice for the novel. He was split, so uh, the, the more you know. I thought Knock at the Cabin was fine. I was intrigued by where everything was going, whether or not the events were actually happening and real, but revealing the truth like midway in the film kind of took away that big M. Night twist that we're usually, you know, banking on. Again, the story was fine, a little heavy-handed on the religious metaphors throughout, and why certain connections were even there, like Rupert being the guy in the bar. Uh, why? and honestly kind of had like a cabin in the woods feel at the end. I'd give it like a low 7 out of 10. But the technical side of things is where this movie shines. This might be Batista's best performance. Very subdued and quiet, reminded me of his bit part from Blade Runner 2049, so he was definitely the standout. And some of the camera work that they did was hella cool. Like Batista is using this weapon at some point, and it like follows the trajectory as he like cranks it back and then goes for a hit. Oh, 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 and M. Knight's cameo was so ridiculously dumb, I couldn't not love it. Basically, they are flipping through TV channels, you know, looking at these newscast apocalypse, and he's just on one selling air fryers in an infomercial for like a solid 15 seconds. Anyway, I kind of do wish that some of this was just a big elaborate goof and they were tricking them, but, uh, you know, whatever, the story was fine. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Knock at the Cabin. Was this one of M. Knight's better films in the last few decades, or is his shtick getting old? And I'll let you know, we're currently running a competition, giving away three copies of Wakanda Forever on the 15th of February, and all you gotta do to get a chance of winning this is like this video, make sure to subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment with your thoughts on Knock at the Cabin down below. We pick the comments at random at the end of every single month, and the winners of last month are on screen right now. So if that's you, message us on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, be sure to check out some of our other videos right over there. Click one, just do it, and knock, 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 knock on one of those videos. But with that out of the way, thank you for your constant support. I've been Jared. I'll see you in the next one. Take care and peace.